How's everybody doing today? Thank you again for uh, showing up, taking time out of your busy day. Um, so we're gonna, here's the outline of today's talk, giving introduction, I know not everybody here is an oceanographer, so we'll show some pretty pictures besides uh, uh, data and everything like that. We'll talk about absolute and relative dispersion. In particular, we're gonna be looking at the GLAD experiment in Gulf of Mexico. Acronyms are very important. So GLAD stands for the Grand Lagrangian <laughs> Deployment. In, in this experiment, um, they put out 300 near surface drifters in the Gulf of Mexico in a very short amount of time and track them in very high resolution uh, using the GPS satellite systems where we're able to get data every five minutes and the final data set after you edit it because you, you don't get data every five minutes for every trajectory all the time where there's data dropouts and there's a little error. So the final data set has a 15 minute resolution which is a very high resolution data set. And the good news is after this experiment, they went and put a thousand drifters in the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and that's called the laser ex uh, experiment. And then we'll discuss the results and, uh, huh? Months, orders of few months, right? The order of a few months. It was constrained by battery life in this case. And this uh, work was supported by the CARTH uh, Consortium, funded by the Gulf of Mexico, uh, research initiative at the, at the time, and, and that was a 10-year program, uh, basically funded by BP. Uh, BP were not very good players in the Gulf of Mexico during the oil spill, and so they made an agreement to give $500 million of funding over 10 years for oceanographic research, and that's a lot of money. It's $50 million a year. This consortium actually got 14% of it, so, you know, that was nice. Um, but $50 million a year is like an NSF science budget. So it was a significant amount of money and it was very sad when the program stopped after 10 years. That was, it was very thin, right. So here's the, uh, you know, punchline of this talk. You know, we have some theory that describes dispersion and that theory is, is a bit old. Um, G.I. Taylor from the 1920s wrote the first much quoted paper on absolute dispersion uh, with uh, applications in the ocean and the atmosphere. And then around the, just a little bit later, around the same time, uh, Richardson you know, proposed uh, his law for relative uh, dispersion. And we'll see how well our data sets match up with this very simple theory. Yes, it can. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay. So dispersion is the whole, all the phenomena that moves things around. Divisivity here is going to mean a metric we put to measure dispersion. I'll show you the various metrics we use to measure the rates of dispersion. It can be waves, eddies, it could be anything. Velocity shear is very important in dispersion. Right, and, and right, and a lot of the simple theory was assuming a homogeneous ocean, zero mean field, et cetera, et cetera, which is not the situation, of course, in in the real world. So here we just dispersion is a process where things usually spread in the ocean, but there are examples at the surface of the ocean when we're dealing with surface drifters that they don't spread, but they actually come together in converted zones, because as Nathan likes to say, drifters don't understand three-dimensional incompressible fluid. They're only a two-dimensional, because of um, buoyancy, they're only a two-dimensional particle, and so they line up in all the convergence zones. Yes? Well, here when we're looking at uh, particle dispersion, I mean, it's, it's given by turbulent diffusion and what you call convection or what we now call advection. Yes, so it's advection and turbulent dispersion is the, the two phenomena. 
Doesn't have to be, no. We could have mean transport. Yeah, yeah, we could, yeah. All right, so let's remind you some things about the ocean. First of all, it's very complicated, which is nice. It gives us long-term employment. Uh, it's not textbook. It's coupled equations, strongly nonlinear coupled equations. And then, of course, we have the turbulence closure problem, trying to write a, a closed set of equations uh, for the statistical moments. And there's no real good way to do it. People have a bunch of approximations. Um, the thing that also makes the ocean complicated is there's, there's different physics at broad range of space-time scales. So when you look at it at the small scale, the physics is different than the large scale. And so the system is not self-similar. So all the self-similarity stuff you learn in math can't help you here. The other thing is, it's in some sense, it's not symmetric because of the Coriolis force in the beta term. It, it's, you know, we have a difference going south and north. And the other thing is, you know, a lot of people like to do analysis where they take ocean data sets and fit it to a set of basis functions. Like if you're in Fourier analysis situation, you, sit at, you, you fit sines and cosines which is good things to do because they are solutions to second order equations. Um, polynomials, we, we do statistical dynamical modes uh, like uh, eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, which we like to call empirical orthogonal functions. Uh, but my belief is you really need to use different set of basis functions in the ocean for different scales. Now, rotation is strong, and the effect depends on latitude, which again, you know, destroys some of the symmetry. Um, we have very variable stratification. Fractal boundaries, in particular, in the Gulf of Mexico, we have coastal zone, a transition zone, and then a, the deep Gulf of Mexico, which behaves like the ocean. Uh, when we look at our data set, it's poorly observed. You know, we, our, our sampling does not satisfy Nyquist-Shannon sampling requirements, and especially if you look at subsurface data. And our statistics are non-Gaussian heterogeneous and non-stationary. You know, when you have Gaussian statistics, you make that assumption, you know, you could, your data and theory does everything uh, for you, but here we can't make that assumption. We can, but it's not totally correct. So here's some examples of the uh, oil spill uh, pictures. Uh, on your left is based on surface roughness measures, measurements from the satellite and this other uh, picture is related to a visible image. So in both of these data sets, we're not exactly uh, at the same time, but very close. These maps show very similar phenomena. And one of the phenomena you see is this long tail. So we have, we have a centralized patch. So there was an oil spill. This is, uh, all right, so that's Northern Florida. And then right in the left wing is the Mississippi Delta. So what would be the scale here is hundreds of kilometers type of scales. Yeah, so this, this, this scale here is hundreds of kilometers in this picture. Yes. Yeah, so this is land up here. This is northern Florida. This is the Mississippi Delta right here. It's where the Mississippi River uh, comes out. This is where the main area of the spill is. This oil's coming up from a, you know, a below surface. And so we have, you know, a lot of dispersion here that looks fairly homogeneous and stuff, you know, with turbulent stirring. But then we have this really long tail, and we see it in the different data sets. And, and that's due to effect of a mesoscale eddy on the flow, a large energetic eddy. So let's look at some simple ideas of how turbulent stirring works. And here's a very good um, study that a lot of people don't know about from Orlando in 1955. And so what he did is he took a very simple system up here on the right. We have a strong current and an eddy. And you could think of this as a Gulf Stream current acting with a cold core ring, for example. And so what he did in this box is numerically, you know, put in particles uh, with different labels. And the labels here well, and for the picture, we'll, we'll call it white and black. And we look at the evolution over time. So this very regular grid, and if we think of this as oil, this is what it's going to do over time. And you can see this very long tail, which is associated with this eddy 
um, uh, dynamics. Uh, the other thing you, you notice, if you look at the dispersion here between points uh, in this part of the tail, they're getting pulled apart at a very fast rate, yet over here the dispersion is much, much slower because of their placement on which, how the particle fell and what part of the dynamical feature. Just simple uh, advection equations. Just a, a very simple set of advection equations. No, 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 very simple. All right, here's another example from Bill Young's uh, notes uh, in script where you put a dye patch and you look at its evolution in time. And what you see is if you calculate the perimeter of the patch, the perimeter here is increasing exponentially in time, and you can show that. So let's look further, and after some time, this is what it looks like. And this is just what some turbulence stirring in there, some high frequency motion. In a very much quoted, really good paper, Arif had showed some interesting results. So here we have a streamline pattern, and around here it's very regular and steady state. What they did in the what he did in the middle of the flow, he put a set of beaters at very high frequency that stirs the fluid. And so then he puts a patch in between these stirrers and looks at the evolution of the patch. And so after you know, a significant uh, uh, time period, this thing does spread out fairly homogeneously over the domain. But if you look at the time history, it's, it's not a homogeneous spread. It's, it's, it's uh, very different. Um, the, the fact that you know, it started to the right was just based on when they put the particles in in the phase of the beaters. Now, one of the results is that these particles themselves are chaotic. It's, if you looked at one particle, it's, it's hard to predict, for example, if it's going to end up on the left or right side of the domain. But if you look at the Eulerian flow, it's not chaotic. So the Lagrangian trajectories themselves are chaotic. And another result that came out here is that a little amount of high frequency turbulence stirring in the fluid increases the variance of uh, whatever you're looking on, by about a factor of two, 100%. So it's a significant increase of the variance in the system. So here, one variance we look at is the position variance, the variance in the position of the particles. So here's some in inexpensive drifters oceanographers have used. Um, we use parsnip. Uh, Henry Stommel went out in a lake <laughs> with people and they threw parsnip in. And it turns out parsnip moves very well with the water. Uh, we use drift to cards and dye, and this is actually from one of the experiments uh, we did. And they, um, we had a uh, like balloon up there with cameras pointing down, and we got lots and lots of realization of how the the, the dye uh, diffused and how the drift of cards diffused. In the old days, they used uh, these. Anybody remember these? Yeah, there's a few old times. I remember these. You know, you used to drop the box of these cards, and it was like, oh, my Lord. You know, you used to drop these off at the computer center, you know, pray, walk away, and come back later on and hope the results were good. Not like today where you just, and the results pop up. There, things are different. And, of course, we have the old, you know, message in the bottle. So those are the old drifters uh, type of stuff. People will look in some new ideas. Uh, one of the first buoys ever used was on the Challenger expedition. Uh, you know, the, the Challenger went out for a few years measuring biophysical, geological, and chemical properties of the ocean, and they visually tracked uh, these drifters. Check the design, very interesting design that they picked out in 1873. And if you look at, the, here's a, a suite of, of our modern drifters, and here's what we call a Davis-style drifter. Um, it's the same design 100 years later. So they, they got it pretty good in the 19th century, and it's, the design is really good at capturing the water flow. So when you put these drifters out, uh, there's some right above the surface because they have to transmit to a satellite in, in, uh, to track them. And so there's windage and water you know, 
pushing things around. You have the two factors, and of course, you want to reduce the windage as small as possible to get the estimate of the ocean velocities. And so here's a RAFOS float that is uh, tracked in the subsurface. This is a European float developed for tracking oil. And this is the workhorse of the drifters. There's usually at least a thousand of these out in the ocean at any given time. Uh, this is a holy sock drogue. It's pretty big, tens of meters. The nominal depth is about 15 meters. And, and you see here, that we have a buoy up here. Oops, we have a buoy up here, and that has the batteries and the satellite uh, transmitter. And I'll show you some trajectories from these data sets. We're measuring position as a function of time, and then we differentiate that to get time, uh, to get velocity. Uh, these are the SOFAR floats developed uh, by my mentor, uh, Tom Rossby, and a group at uh, Woods Hull. Uh, they, they weighed 1,000 a, a uh, pounds, so like 400-something you know, kilograms. They were very heavy and needed special equipment. So they would make a low-frequency sound, 250 hertz every eight hours, and we would pick them up at listening stations and track them by triangulating the sound in a simple theory. Of course, you do, there's other, you look at some differences and you could do hyperbolic tracking differences. And this is the Rafos float, which is so far float spelled backwards, and so far was for sound fixing and ranging. Uh, we have a, a sound channel in the ocean where sound travels a great distance in the ocean. It's in the main thermocline, and it's because of the pressure temperature distribution in the ocean and basically Snell's law at work. You get a, a, a refraction of the waves in the, the, in the um, sound channel, and that energy you go pretty far. And what I find is always interesting is the, the sound channel is where the velocity is the minimum, but the sound energy goes the farthest. Physics sometimes is, <laughs> you get interesting results when you look at the details, which is not good to first guess. So here, you see these rafos. You could literally throw them in, in, in the ocean with your hand. This is Phil Richardson, uh, uh, by the way. And they turn the technology around. So these floats listen, and they record the time of arrivals. They pop up at the end of their mission, send the data to the satellite. And listening takes a lot less energy than making sound in the ocean. And that's, when you looked at those big floats, they were really big because you needed a lot of batteries, which are heavy, and then they had to put, you know, hollow, you know, structure to it to give it the negative buoyancy to cancel out the positive buoyancy. So, you know, very cool instruments. And let's show you some data. Uh, this is a very nice uh, track from the late 70s one of the first surface drifters uh, they put in, and this tracked the cold core eddy. So what we see here is rotary motion, and in this case, the rotary motion is slightly stronger than the translational motion, but there's some translational motion, so we have a, you know, an eddy moving around like this and translating in the mean flow. If the rotary motion equals the translation motion, you get cycloids. I love this drifter. This is like a textbook drifter. So this is a near-surface drifter uh, launched by Don Olson and others in Florida Bay over here. So the, the time period here is between dots is one day. So the, the greater the distance between the dots, of course, the greater the velocity. So here it's in the Florida Bay, coastal um, regime, very slow flow. It's caught up in the Gulf Stream very fast. Uh, it gets deflected offshore, and it gets deflected near what's known as the Charleston Bump cute name, topographic feature in the ocean that causes, and we see the deflection of the Gulf Stream in satellite images of sea surface temperature, for example, at the same place. So it was interesting the float did that. Then here it slowed down because it was kicked out of the Gulf Stream, but then it gets re-entrained and it maps out all the meander crests and troughs in the stream. And then it comes here, and here the Gulf Stream does a bunch of stuff. It, you know, there's things. It could, go around and complete the circuit in the subtropical gyre, and that looks what this float is doing, but once it gets out of the stream, you can see the velocities are an order of magnitude lower. And just to let you know, it could have went to the east and eventually entered the uh, Straits of Gibraltar in the um, Azor current, uh, or it could have went up to the North Atlantic current, which Nathan wrote a nice paper with A. Carnes about, and 
or it could have gone to the northeast in the more general North Atlantic drift. So depending on what realization, you get different results. So this one looked like it was going to. Where did you do all the Here's 40. So, you know, England is zero. So it would be twice <laughs> that right here. <laughs> Oh yeah, this is a typical configuration, yes. Yeah, some of it does. Part of it does, you're right. It goes in the North Atlantic Drift and eventually feeds the Norwegian current. But there's some of it that goes up this side and feeds the North Atlantic current, which is more on the west, and then some of it recirculates. And eventually, you know, in, if you believe all that, it's gonna hit the subtropical gyre, we're gonna hit the uh, North Equatorial Current and it's gonna return and come in somewhere. But very interesting drifter, one drifter. Look at all this great information. Let's show you another drifter. This is a drifter we got our money's worth out of. Uh, look, at, it lasted much longer than we thought, almost four years. And so it enters here. Well, actually it was launched here by the islands. And while it's over here, it's in the Caribbean current. And then this very tight flow against the coast is the Yucatan current, and here's a nice example of the loop current. Here's the Gulf Stream, and here it gets kicked out of the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream meanders here are kind of small, and then again, we get this surface drifter getting caught in the subtropical gyre. So it visited all these different currents for us and made measurements. This is a, you know, this is, again, this is our like bang for the buck drifter. Lots of data, lots of different dynamical regimes the sur near surface drifter visited. All right, here's, you know, we, we think of dispersion of things coming apart. And so these are RAFOS floats uh, down in the thermocline of the ocean. Uh, this is the California current, which, and so in color is temperature. And so we have cold, up wa cold water being upwelled here. And here's three different drifter trajectories. So one started up here and went south. One started here and went offshore, one started here and didn't do much of anything, and they pretty much ended up in the same area. This is a unique case. Uh, this is why I'm showing it to you, and this was a compliment to Toby Garfield, and this is... Right. Yeah. Well, it, it's kind of a, it, this happened because a whole bunch of things happened to line up at the same time. The, the, this here is being driven by the California current. This is, and these two are more driven by eddy flow. And it just so happened the trajectories end up at the same place. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Yes. Well, yeah, it, it's, yeah, um, Monterey, let's see. California, yeah, right. Yeah, I've actually never seen that. I'll have to go out there and, and check it out. But yeah, that's, this is the general uh, area of that. That's, that's correct. Here's some other examples of Rafos floats, uh, compliments of uh, Amy uh, Bauer. And so this is floats here. This is the Iberian uh, Peninsula, uh, Cape St. Vincent's. They launched the floats here, and you can see these floats are caught in eddies. And the other thing you notice, uh, the, the, the light contours are the topographic contours of the bottom, and that there is some topographic control. Now, we even see that more over here in these floats. So here's Greenland and Iceland, and the color shades have to do with the topographic depth. So even though these Rafos floats are, in, in this case, you know, at least 1,000 meters off the bottom or more, this very tight topographic control. You can see as all these floats go around the topography in these areas. Huh? 
Right, or yeah, over here. Is the flow there? And in the flow, of course, is constrained. In the in the in the limit of small relative vorticity, the and no dissipation and forcing, the flow is over F over H contours. And we're seeing examples of that. Of the time scales. The time the, the timing of the tracking. Do you look at the well, inertial oscillations, the time scale is a half a day to a day, right? A, a few days. And if you look at eddies, the small eddies have a rotational period on the order of five days a week. The larger mesoscale eddies, the average rotational period is like nine to 12, even 14 days. Huh? They, they intentionally put them in eddies. They were looking to put them in eddies. These are the medis. They were looking to put them in, into the, what's called medis, Mediterranean eddies. And one of the things that distinguish these eddies, they have a very strong salinity signal. And that salinity signal is then sent out to the rest of the ocean and then turbulently stirred everywhere else. So the interesting thing mathematically is if you look at the salt tongue in this part from west to east, there's a huge salt tongue that looks like you're evecting the salt out of the Mediterranean. But if you calculate the mean flow, it goes in the wrong direction. And it's because of turbulent diffusion that we have um, this salt tongue. It's not just due to evection, but if you looked at a map of the salinity distribution across the whole uh, tropical, subtropical Atlantic Ocean, it looks like there's a strong evective flow. But turbulent diffusion is what's doing it. Yes, well, and that's done with other type of measurements, CTDs, conductivity, temperature, depth measurements, yes. And, hmm? what's that? Uh, through measuring um, conductivity. Right, there's a very strong relationship between, yeah, okay. Uh, here's another very uh, nice picture from Amy Bauer and Tom Rossby. The color is sea surface temperature. This, of course, again, is the Gulf Stream meandering. And these are Rafel's floats, so the color associated with SST is literally the upper millimeter of the ocean. That's what you're measuring from the AVHRR satellite, you're measuring the radiance. Yes, you're measuring the outgoing radiance, which is related to the temperature. And then these are Rafel's float trajectories of they're in the thermocline, say, order 500 meters depth, some deeper, some a little shallower. But this, and, and, and this white plus is the date and time that corresponds to the satellite image. So this shows how it does a really good job of tracking the stream. And these RAFOS uh, floats are approximately isopycnal floats, so that they do a really good job of following the water. Uh, here's, here's an interesting thing. You, you want to say, do we see hyperbolic points in nature? Here's an example. So they went out, uh, they put, these are so far floats, they put the five floats in the water, and actually they're trying to put floats that stay together so we can measure dynamical quantities, like the terms in the potential vorticity equation, which I did my dissertation on. Uh, but here, one goes <laughs> to the west, one goes to the east, one has some south, one has north, and one stays around. This is uh, uh, as close as we're going to see to a textbook hyperbolic point in the ocean. So when they saw that, I said, wow, you know, you, you, you have theory that predicts stuff like this, and here it is. Yeah, location of the float every day. Yeah, yeah. Unless I... Uh, yeah, float 63 went to the west, float 57 went to the east. Right, well, they're floats. They have a number, yeah, and we track them. Yeah. These were originally tracked by Navy listening stations, and then later on they put autonomous listening stations to increase the domain. Well, here's an interesting thing. So these were floats from the same experiment uh, put in in May, I think, of 78, right? Yeah, May 78. And most of the floats have a westward component, either southwest or northwest. Uh, this topographic feature here to give you 
yeah, is Bermuda, to give you an idea of where we are. Um, two months later, we put the floats in, and most of them go to the east, only two months later. So now if I ask you, just take this data set and calculate the mean Eulerian flow, this is what the mean Eulerian flow would look like. And if you see this area in here, there's a striking horizontal divergence in the flow, which isn't real, but is an artifact of combining the data from different time periods. If we had lots and lots of data where n approaches infinity, we wouldn't see this. So this, again, shows you the problems of analyzing Lagrangian data or most ocean data sets that violate the sampling you know, requirements that Nyquist and Shannon told us that we should obey to get unbiased results. Okay, it's very easy. In this part of the ocean, if you look at the kinetic energy associated with the mean, and then you look at the kinetic energy associated with the variability, which we call eddy kinetic energy, the eddy kinetic energy is much greater than the mean kinetic energy. So these are due to space-time variability in the flow. The eddies were going in a different direction at the time. Now, there could also be the surface currents due to, you know, this is, you know, it, it, sorry, now these were at 700 meters in the thermocline. If these were surface floats, it would be much easier to explain, ah, oh, the wind changed direction. And that's, you know, that would be an easy explanation. But here, these are in the main thermocline away from the surface. So it's, it's the fact that the flow there is much different on, on these time scales. The, the, the flow in the ocean is truly non-stationary, and I'm going to show some more examples of that. So if you go in the No. No, they'll be completely different. Completely different. The eddies are, are, are very energetic, and the, the, where they are at any given you know, point in space and time is fairly random in an area. Uh, no, not at all. No, no. No, no, no. You, you have a better chance of that with surface drifters being forced by the wind. But here in the thermocline, it's being the, the predominant motion is the eddy variability in the flow, and it's highly variable. Uh, I talked yesterday about this. This is very interesting. All right, so let's tell you about this plot. Latitude, longitude, the contours are F over H, where it's been normalized, where this, the center point is zero, zero, just uh, for illustration purposes. So here, this group of floats, which is in the lower main thermocline at 1,300 meters, uh, which is basically the barotropic mode, because at 1,300 meters, it's the first crossing of the baroclinic mode in this region, these floats go up F over H contours. Well, if you look at conservation of re relative vorticity to keep the, of, uh, sorry, conservation of potential vorticity, to keep it conserved, it has to develop relative vorticity, and it has to develop negative relative vorticity, and sure enough, it does. You can see the floats turn around. Now, here, they're going down into lower and lower values of F over H. They have to get positive vorticity. And if you look at the space-time characteristics, if you calculate the dominant frequency, the dominant wave number, the phase speeds, this is a barotropic Rossby wave. So Tom, the son of C.G. Rossby, went out there, they put floats in the ocean, and had one of the best observations of a Rossby wave in a fluid <laughs> at that time. So that was kind of cool. And this is a picture I showed yesterday. I told you I love showing this picture. huh? Well, yeah, there's some influence from the, the, the it's, barotro, it's barotropic at this step, predominantly barotropic. So, yeah, if the, 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 the flu. Huh? Well, well, it's F over H. I mean, it, it, there's some topography effects, yes, yes, because it's barotropic and it's feeling the bottom. That's why. Okay. All right, so here's the picture yesterday I showed. This is the floats that were in that wave. So here at each location, each vertex of the triangle is a float position. And then you, you connect all the nearby floats up into triangles. And then after the fact, and after looking at the motion for a while, you do this color coding. And here's the Rossby wave. And after a couple months here, 
it really doesn't change its shape. Waves have very little dispersion, linear waves. And then this eddy has a lot of dispersion, turbulent stirring. And the stuff in white is background flow, and the eddies do a really good job of stirring the background flow. And what do we see again? We see filaments. Turbulent stirring produces filaments. We see it everywhere in the ocean. Well, yeah, uh, but in, in a more general setting, just fill, you know, the, the shape is filamented. Yes. Now, here's another set of trajectories from th that experiment um, where they went approx approximately almost order of magnitude 1,000 kilometers they traveled. And so I took out the mean motion, and here's the motion relative to the mean. There's no diffusivity. These floats stayed together coherently at this time. Why? It's the path, these got caught, let's see, this would be in the uh, subtropical countercurrent. And that time the, the subtropical current, countercurrent was strong, the eddy variability was somewhat weak, and very little diffus the diffusivity. So I, I, this is in one of the chapters in the, the LabCod book. And the title of this chapter was, Where's the Diffusivity? Well, I was thinking if I took the mean motion out, I, I might be able to see something. Because the mean motion is so strong up there, it, it's masking the other signal. So I figured if I take the mean motion out, I may see something. Huh? Huh? Right. I was seeing if there was going to be any obvious pattern in the deviation. I was looking for any obvious patterns in the deviation from the mean. And as you, could, as you said, uh, right, there's no diffusivity here, right. Right, that's why we, we wrote a book chapter, a, a, a part of a book chapter on, the, on this trajectory. There's no diffusivity. Lots of diffusivity. <laughs> this was pretty much the same uh, uh, time period when the floats were there. So this time, lots of diffusivity and, and then hardly any diffusivity in this other set of trajectories. We'll, we'll, get, back, we'll get to that one. OK, so here's a little very simple model. Uh, you know, very simple, straight Florida current, you know, none of the meandering or any other stuff. And this shows a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer box of, say, oil. And here's the time going on. And this is the dispersion of these particles if they were oil. Now, the other thing we could represent this box is say we, in the middle of this box, we had a lost ship. We didn't know quite the position, and we had a 10 kilometer uncertainty in the position. So this is a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer uncertainty in the position of the box. Over time, it fills out an area of 10,000 square kilometers in three days. And this is one of the reasons the Coast Guard stops looking for people after three days. It becomes the needle in the haystack problem. Simple, simple infection. Yeah, I'm gonna show you. All right, I'm gonna show you the components. So component one. So one of the components of that is uh, simple Gaussian homogeneous diffusion. So that's part of the, the uh, terms that go in to calculate the full picture I showed earlier. And I'm now going to show you the second component, which is the evective component. And it has a little bit of shear in it. So that's just, you know, I'm going to Right, dispersion, right. This is, in many ways, is very simple to analyze. This is the evection by the mean flow, and I have a, a thin jet with the scales associated with the Florida current, and you can just see, you know, the, 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 um, the center point is moving a little faster than the side points because it's like a Gaussian jet. The velocity profile in the core stream direction is set to be a Gaussian jet with a width uh, that's on the order of the Gulf Stream uh, width, width, which is order, you know, 
uh, order 100 kilometers or less. So you can see after 72 hours what it does. And when you put these two different effects together, this is what you get. Yeah, yeah, so this is just a replay of the first one I showed you. And you can see with those two effects, huh? Right, the Florida current's fast. <laughs> right. All we have is straight evection and a Gaussian term, and that's it. And this is simple. The real Gulf Stream bends and got kinks in the end. I mean, this is the simplest model I could do this with and look at the, uh, you know, the, how fast things disperse. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons we have the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> so let's talk about absolute dispersion. So we're going to talk about particle statistics, and to keep things simple, let's talk one-dimensional, but it, everything generalizes to 3D, of course. So in the G.I. Taylor work, he looked at displacements from initial positions. So you, you mark everything at t equals zero and f look at how it evolved. Though just to point out, some people do remove the mean in their calculations, and they state that up front. But most people use the top um, equation. So if we look at the mean square particle displacement, why do we look at mean square? The same reason we look at variance is because if we look at the average uh, displacement, we could get a lot of plus and minus displacements averaging out to near zero, and yet we could have a lot of dispersion. So we need mean square displacement. And uh, random walk molecular case, the diffusivity is defined to be. So when I talk about dispersion, it's the, all the physical processes that move things around in the ocean, but we want to quantify that. I'm going to quantify it with this quantity diffusivity, which is I'm going to define as the mean squared displacement squared uh, divided by 2 delta t. Anybody know who, who was the first one that derived that formula? We got a winner. Extra credit for this gentleman. <laughs> OK, now, so now for us oceanographers, based on the work of G.I. Taylor in the 20s and people that came after him, this is how we define diffusivity. The variance, the DDT, with a 2 of the mean squared displacement. So that's our definition of diffusivity. And so if I calculate that, that will give me a diffusivity coefficient. 2 delta, 2, 2 dt. It's, it's 2 dt. Well, I don't have delta, but this mean squared dis displacement is relative to the initial position. So there, it is a, a delta x in there, right? Right. OK, so I didn't make this up. You know, somebody else, I, I just had <laughs> this is This is what's used in our field. Taylor assumes stationary weak Lagrangian statistics. And for small time, the mean square displacement is proportional to the time, so tau is t minus t naught squared. And for large time, it becomes the mean square displacement has a linear shape. No, it, it, it is, and it's diffusing faster because it's delta t squared. So here are some estimates of that diffusivity constant from a paper from Bolin. So mesoscale Eddie Stern has numbers like 10 squared to 10 third. These estimates are too low. They were in a peer-reviewed published paper. Um, good, good paper, but their estimates are a little too low. Submesoscale and eternal waves. So there's a lot of um, difference in the diffusivity associated with different physical phenomena. But again, uh, these estimates I feel are too low, and I'll show you my estimates later on. Now, if we look at the dispersion for all of the floats uh, in a particular experiment, so this was an ex uh, experiment, uh, well, five different experiments, right? So Northeast Atlantic experiments, LDE experiments, all, everything done in either the Northeast, Northwest Atlantic, all the different trajectories. And shown here is the T squared behavior for small time lag. And here's large time lag T behavior 
And this is what's from the data, and this is from the theory, and here are the error bars associated with these estimates. So, you know, qualitatively, it looks okay. 100 days. Now, when we look at fields like this, like the Gaussian dispersion, which I showed you in the uh, video, Ficken diffusion models work really good. However, when we really look at what's happening in the real ocean, it's turbulent diffusion. You get the filamentation, the patchiness uh, in the dispersion. So we get filamentation and patches. We see this in all over the ocean in many different fields. So when we look at very simple dif uh, diffusion, the one particle statistic does a pretty good job of describing this, but when we look at the turbulent diffusion, which produces filaments and patchiness, uh, people like to use two particle statistics. So let's define the two particle statistics. Um, in the term, since it's two particles, and we're gonna look at the separation in time between the one particle in the other minus the mean separation squared. And so the results we could show depends on the initial separation. The process as T increases in time is accelerating. And at some point, the particles are gonna become independent of each other. As they disperse further away, the flow, uh, the velocity statistics are independent of, of each other. And you could show that for really large T, the relative vorticity is equal to twice the absolute vorticity because each particle comes independent. And so th this particle has an absolute dispersion and this one has it in the, the differences to the absolute dispersion. And so schematically, what we're looking at is particles that had some initial separation and then at a later time, they had a different separation. So we wanna see how this separation as a function of time behaves based on data. So Richardson in his very famous uh, 1926 uh, paper proposed that this function is, it's gonna behave as L to the four third. And he based this on observations, you know, observing. He made a lot of observations. Uh, some of the things he was observing were smoke coming out of smokestacks in England, for example. And it's interesting if, if you look at what K is for Fickian diffusion, it's uh, by scaling it, it's gonna be a, a distance squared over time just based on dimensional analysis. Here we pull a, a mid 19th century result due to Fourier that Y squared is proportional to T cubed for heat diffusion on a line. And if you put these two together, T is Y to the two thirds. And so K, you know, you substitute in for T, we get Y to the four thirds. And then Akuba, showed this uh, more rigorously in 1941, you know, working in the Russian School of Turbulence with the, you know, the really good crew that was there, Kolmogorov's crew, and they were, you know, showed this result. It's not rigorous, but a good guess can be a good theory. <laughs> but people have shown this more rigorously. Uh, Batchelor in, the, in his book uh, in the 50s also showed this. So here's Akubo, 1971, in a highly, uh, quoted study where he went in lots of different places and calculated uh, this dispersion and sure enough it, it had the the um, dependency that they were looking for that the variance in the position is related to uh, T cubed which applies the L to the four third relationship. So the thing to note is is this constant here. So what this result shows it's the constant's different depending on where you go. But the general functional form within error bars is, is the same. And if you notice, this goes from 10 meters to up to almost 1,000 kilometers. So a very large range. So let's motivate Richardson's model for relative dispersion. If we had a concentration of particles, we know that the CDT, which we'll linearize as that, is equal to the change of K dc dx dx. So this is Ficking diffusion model, linear with no sources and no sinks. 
If we let Q of L equal the number of particles at a distance from each other, we want to come up with a law now where K becomes F of L, because we know it's a function of L. And so DL key, DF of E, this, is a model that looks like a Fickian model. So here, we're going to call F of L the relative diffusivity. And in the limit for very large time, as the particles disperse away from each other, F of L will equal uh, 2K is a, is a theoretical result. Now we could look at the energy uh, associated. And you could show that L squared is proportional to T cubed in the three, uh, 3D inertial subrange, which also turns out to be the same power law when you have shear dispersion. So uh, having it proportional to T to cubed, it's um, you know, fast. Now, if we're in a two-dimensional turbulence regime, you could show that LT of squared is an exponential. And in general, uh, you know, it's going to be some tau to the n power with usually tau squared for intermediate tau and order tau for long time scales. Because for long time scales, it's going to look like absolute dispersion and absolute dispersion, that's the result. So one of the games we play is, let's calculate what n is. Right? Or let's calculate the functional form. Is it 2D or 3D? So that's a good game to play. And we'll show you some data in, in a slide or two. But before we do that, let's mention Bennett's work where he talked about local and non-local effects. So local relative dispersion is dominated by motion at the scales of separation. Highly convoluted paths and Richardson uh, dispersion. On the other hand, non-local dispersion is set by the large scale energetic eddies like we've seen that caused that large filament and, and tail in the oil, oil spill data from one of the first pictures I, sh I showed you, and that's going to have exponential dispersion. And so that's more like a 2D uh, turbulent um, situation. So non-local turbulence is going to be closer to a 2D situation. The local stuff is going to be closer to a three-dimensional uh, type of dispersion. So uh, Rick Wonkin and Shane, Elibar looked at drift to pair uh, separation, again, in the Northwest Atlantic in the region of the Gulf Stream. So here's a bunch of their data uh, set. These are just different trajectories shown. And here's the result. Um, oops. All right, so this is a climb mode. Let me see some. Huh, I'm missing a slide. Rats. All right, so I'm missing the slide. Let me tell you what happens. At the smallest time uh, from initial displacement, the relative uh, dispersion looks exponential. The exponential uh, curve fits at the best. Then once we get to a time scale greater than a few integral time scales, where the integral time scale is an integral of the correlation function over time times two. So when we look at a few integral time scales in the problem, then we start seeing the classic more relative dispersion case that Richardson looked at. So at the smallest time scales, we do see the dominance of an exponential movement. But then at longer times, it settles down to more like Richardson's uh, four-third law. Okay, let's move on. All right, so somehow that one got doubled. Uh, here's some dispersion statistics uh, from floats. So here's the relative dispersion in kilometers squared as a function of days for different data sets. Uh, here, here, here. And then when we look at particularly the LDE 1300 meter floats, Here's the diffusivity versus the distance. We see the four-third law, very noisy though, here. And then here, this is what 2K should be. And you know, a little bit, <laughs> the real ocean doesn't satisfy the theory. But at least order of magnitude, qualitatively, quantitatively wise, qualitatively wise, there is an agreement, even though there's not an exact agreement. Here's another set of drifters where they have the, the displacement order one, 
and then the two decay with, within the noise looks a, a lot better. And again, here's the relative dispersion in time of the particles. So there's three different sets of groups shown here with, with error bars around all of those. So on the left is relative dispersion, and on the right is absolute dispersion. The relative is it's the particle separation. Each, Each you, you measure all the different. So if you have n drifters, you have n times n minus one over two particle pairs. Right. You average over that. The, 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 how much it travels is a function of distance between them. Oh, so here's the here was somehow we got out of place. So here's the one I was looking for. So down here, showing you. Uh, all right. So let me explain this. We have mean square separation as a function of time. So if we look at the thick black curve, that's the data. That's what we would like to fit with different theory. And associated with it is a light curve around it. And of course, that's an error bar. In this case, 95% confidence interval. So if we do Richardson law, it's the thick gray dash curve. So it's this one. So you can see once we get like about right here past a day or so, it's pretty much Richardson. But when you look here, it's not Richardson. So what could it be? Well, if you look at the exponential thick gray curve, it fits it really well. But then at this point, it does a terrible job. It's no longer exponential. So here we had non-local effects. And, and this is basically what we've seen with the oil spill with that tail. It's the non-local effects due to the energetic eddies. And then once we're past that regime, Richardson gives us a very good result, a very good result. Um, and then the thin black uh, curve would be the, what we would see if it was just a purely white noise driven type of diffusion. So you can see that the diffusion in the ocean is orders, because it's a, a log scale on the left, is orders of magnitude greater than simple molecular type of Brownian type diffusion motion because of the turbulence stirring. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the GLAD experiment. Uh, here's a paper and all my uh, co-authors uh, on that paper. I did almost all the work, me and Ed. <laughs> Even though I got 27 people on there. But it was a big experiment. Everybody had to get their uh, credit. Uh, some of the stuff I'm not going to get into in detail, I just wanted to mention, when we, we calculated the dominant uh, periods in e-folding scale of the drifters, it was very closely related to the dominant e-folding and period scales of the wind. These are near surface drifters now. These are literally measuring the upper meter flow. So in this data set, we're dealing with an, you know, um, the near surface, the upper uh, one meters. Well, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to, we're going to calculate a bunch of diffusivities and show you uh, the theory with a very large data set. So here's the, here's the drifter they used, uh, Davis-style drifter. We put out 300 of them. Um, just to mention, when we put these out, we got a lot of uh, comments about throwing all this PVC in the ocean. Uh, and when I would give my talks, I said, well, once these drifters stop transmitting, they're floating around, they're floating fish habitats. You see one of these out there in the ocean, they usually have bait fish and large fish around them. <laughs> but uh, after this experiment, in the later part of the consortium's uh, lifetime, they developed a near-surface drifter with better water-following characteristics, influenced less by the surface waves. Uh, because they put a flexible chain here. But the other th cool thing about it is this drifter dissolves. It's biodegradable. It dissolves. The plastic was invented uh, for use with kids' toys. When you know kids would take their toys to the beach, they'd all get taken out to sea because the kids would leave them in the surf zone. So this actually dissolves. All right, so here's the... Um, what? We won't get into that discussion right now. All right, so here's the Mississippi Delta. Here's the scale. So this is order 400 
kilometers by 500 kilometers. Here's our main sampling pattern. So these were, what was it, 500 meters apiece. This distance was in order 100 meters. So we, they would put out each one of these dots, they would put out nine drifters in this pattern of 100 meters by 100 meters. So very close, 500 meters, and then the dots are spread out. And we did different areas. We did this area called L. Why we picked this one, there was an energetic eddy that was very obvious here. We did two surveys, S1 and S2. Uh, why was that? That was in the area of the deep water horizon. And T was in the DeSoto Canyon area, uh, which has a lot of, it's a major ground for fish larvae, uh, for large tuna and mai mai and swordfish spawning. So here are all the trajectories, 300 trajectories. So they went all over the place. We got lots of samples, lots of good data. Every 15, you know, the final data set was every 15 minutes. So to show you, so here's another what we call a spaghetti diagram, where you just put all the drifter trajectories on it. Very good name for spaghetti. Um, here's the individual dots. Here's the sampling again. And showing you what one of these S1 and S2, here's the S1 and S2 array. So each of these uh, locations, uh, we put out nine uh, drifters. And here's the initial. So the, the fast moving line, of course, is the ship. And just showing you the initial time, what the drifters are doing, very short uh, amount of time. Well, that went fast, so let's see. So that's what they do initially. At very small scales, these drifters here in this experiment stay together. Here is a reconstruction of the velocity field that um, Lucas Lorendo did for us using a new method uh, to maximize uh, the strength of the flow, minimizing the smearing of averaging on Eulerian coordinates. So the, the fitting method on this uh, was based, assuming we're gonna have a, a current in this area and fitting uh, a cross stream current uh, profile uh, to that. And what you can see here, we have a large amount of very vigorous eddies Usually, the loop current is up like this. It, it comes up to the, about here, and then comes back down, but at this point, the loop current had broken off to a big loop current eddy, and the loop current was in its southern path. So this is now the loop current, and then over time, it's gonna grow. And here, E, D, C, B, A are bifurcation points. The flow goes here, flow goes there, here, there. So there's, very strong bifurcation in these areas, and it's where the eddies are interacting with each other. Now, one of the interesting things about this is, if you look at the mean flow, it, the flow is up here in the mean, if you look at all the data over all time, the loop current. During this event, we had a certain superpositioning of the eddies, which formed this transport highway, which actually takes properties, and we can see this in the ocean color fields, uh, chlorophyll data from the satellites, that takes the properties from the northern Gulf of Mexico towards the Yucatan principle, uh, Peninsula, and you'll, and you'll see some examples of the flow in a little while here, but this was really fast, but if you looked at the mean flow, you would never guess this would happen. The eddy variability is so strong, it gives us so many surprising results whenever we put Lagrangian data in the ocean. So let's look at a movie. So these are the trajectories, and here's that path. We called it the highway to hell. The drifters went out of the area too quick. <laughs> and where are the eddies? Here's the big eddies. That's a big eddy right there. Here's a big eddy. Now you notice all the little stuff. Anybody want to tell me? Not you, Nathan. I know you know the answer. What's all this little motion? You see this little oscillations going on. Anybody want to tell me what that motion is? It's all over the place. That's a very good guess. And if you, if, unless you do a detailed analysis, you, that guess would be okay. Very good guess, but not correct. There is some of that motion in these trajectories. The predominant motion there are inertial oscillations. The free solution to the Navier-Sokes equation. These are inertial oscillations. By the... Well... Well, there's some places where the, the period is exactly the same here, <laughs> twice a day. 
So, all right, so let's look at this a little bit more. So this is later on in the experiment. And I'm gonna, there's, gonna be a, there's gonna be a track coming out here. There it is. Anybody wanna guess what that is? Look what happens to the trajectories. Look what happens to the inertial oscillations. They get huge. So let's do that again. So we got very small inertial oscillations, very small. We got some eddies. And then all of a sudden we have this feature, which I'll tell you what it is in a second. And what, look what happens when this feature goes over our drifters. The inertial oscillations become larger. And then, when it gets close to the coast, a lot of our drifters ended up in the coast, coastal zone. Yeah, it's a hurricane. It's a hurricane. What do we know about the radius of inertial oscillations? It's, it's the velocity divided by F. The winds picked up by orders of magnitude, increased the surface velocity, so increased the radius of our inertial oscillations. So, Hey, the theoreticians are doing something right. Yeah, they're doing something right here. Uh, the interesting thing, though, also is all these drifters that ended up on the coast, which the, the real oil did also. All right, so I'm going to talk about this one trajectory. Uh, there's hundreds of them, and I could spend the next two days talking about them all. I love trajectories. So here's very small oscillations, mostly inertial, but as you're right, there's some tidal influence in these, and then down here, we get into situations where there's larger eddies. Here is the autocorrelation function. The solid line is for U, the dashed line is for V, and here's the cross-correlation between U and V, and this is what a solitary motion looks like in an autocorrelation function. What's the time scale? You know, I could do a, a really thorough analysis, but hey, Let's see, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten peaks in around ten days. It's about a day. These are inertial oscillations. You see in the data. All right, so this is the first, this was calculated over the first 30 days of data. Let me show you the same correlation function for the last 30 days of data. So we see, still see some inertial oscillations. And the reason we're able to see this is we're tracking these floats every 15 minutes. There's a lot of drifter trajectories that were only tracked eight hours in the old days before we you know, had these ni nice high-tech satellite systems out there with GPS and all this other stuff. And when you look at the old data sets, you don't see this inertial oscillations because the sampling was too poor. But the other thing you notice is what's the dominant period besides the inertial oscillations? It's on the order of 10 to 12 days. Mesoscale eddies. So this is the correlation function, the first 30 days of data. Here's the correlation function for the last 30 days of da data. So nobody here would disagree that the statistics are non-stationary. <laughs> so this is, this is coastal, uh, coastal flow, deep ocean flow. So now let's, go qu let's get quantitative. So here's the diffusivity for you. We're looking at variance in X, diffusivity for V, variance in Y, straight arithmetic average to calculate the expected value, total horizontal diffusivity is defined in a standard way. And under Kähler's assumption, KU is equal to the variance times the integral time scales. That's a, a result that comes out of Taylor's uh, work. So what are the values we typically see? So these are the values we typically see. So near the coast, we see order 10 squared to 10 third usually, and we get in the deeper ocean, we see everywhere from 10 to the third to up to 10 to the fifth. There's quite a range of diffusivity, three orders of magnitude range that's been measured in the ocean from coastal zone with coastal zones, deep oceans, and some of these are tropical Pacific, some in the Antarctic circumpolar current, lots of different places. The tropical Pacific estimate. Right, but we're in deep ocean dynamic regime. Yeah, we're in a coastal regime here. Um, yeah, this I was a co I was a co-author on this paper with uh, Sonia and Annalisa and other people. 
those are the numbers people got before. So let's look at some of our numbers calculated for the experiment. All right, first of all, we're going to look at the square root of total dispersion in kilometers. And this is on the particular year day, and these are the different arrays. So according to theory, everything should be increasing, but you notice at times they decrease. Well, if you think about eddies, they come back. So it's not surprising we've seen it's decreasing. So let's just line them all up on the same day. And so here's the total behavior. And then if I average the four uh, different experiments, I get this behavior here. You see this large increase here? Anybody want to guess what, when this was? Huh? Yeah, why do we all of a sudden see this huge increase in some of these after 30 days? This is the hurricane. So I basically cut it off here because we get into a whole different regime with the hurricane. <laughs> now, here we go. Here's diffusivity calculated using the formal definition of taking derivatives. Now, we all know that if the data has noise in it, taking derivatives can make your estimates more noisy. So this is the diffusivity multiplied by 10 to the third. So here's 10 to the fifth here, and then the fourth is over here. So what we have here is the individual groups showing how the diffusivity changes in time. This is actual, actual calculations. And why we're getting all of this oscillation is because these floats are in either inertial oscillations or mesoscale eddies or submesoscale eddies. Now, the black dots on here are estimates based on Taylor. So now, if we take all the data and average them, and these are 300 drifters, this is a really large experiment, here's what the diffusivity looks like. So after five days, which is about twice the integral time scale, things get fairly flat as we expect. And so this is an average of the direct calculation with the derivatives. And if you average over enough, you average out the, all these oscillations. And these black dots are based on Taylor's uh, azototic theory that the diffusivity is proportional to the variance time the integral time scales in the problem. So there's order of magnitude agreement at best with Taylor's theory. So let's look at a spatial map of diffusivity and uh, times 1,000. So remember, it's times 10 to the third. So down here in, in this color, we have numbers that are you know, 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth type of numbers. And then here, we get 10 to the fifth type of numbers. And if you look at where, if you look at when and where the dispersion is the largest, where is easy? It's the bifurcation points. When is when the hurricane went over the, uh, the array. I'll tell you, when a hurricane goes over your drifter array, it's a good engineering test. Um, some of the drifters, when we measured the velocity, they were out of the ocean. They were flying through, literally flying through the air. So they were easy to tell that they weren't in the ocean. I mean, they were flying. All right. So this is uh, work. Uh, uh, pretty uh, much uh, done by Drew Poget and a, and a bunch of people. And let's look at this curve on the left. So Ka is defined to be R delta V, and it's shown in solid lines and filled black circles. So that's our observations. And then the open black symbols show estimates based on this idea, one half the ADT, where A of T is an area, the change in area. So that procedure has a tendency to underestimate uh, the diffusivity. And shown here are data from the Akubo study. So what we could see is we have the dispersion has the same functional form, i.e. the Richardson form, uh, because Akubo's uh, data did. And if you look at K of A, it scales as R to the four thirds. The only big difference is the coefficient is going to have to be two orders of magnitude 
larger in our case, but Akubo's is smaller, yeah. And uh, here's some other dispersion uh, diagrams, which we won't get into at this uh, time. Uh, maybe I should mention something here. So on the top, in the dark lines, is the dispersion mentioned, uh, measured from S1 and S2. On the bottom, if we took the altimeter data and measured geostrophic velocities, and use the geostrophic velocities from altimeter data to, to do the calculation. So you could see that the geostrophic velocities is not the full story here. And it's no big surprise because you know we have a very significant ageostrophic motion due to Ekman with the, the wind uh, forcing in the system. What? Yeah, yeah. And, and it has to do also with the space-time scales of the sea surface height fields, which are space-time interpolated. And as I mentioned yesterday, they're too smooth. They're too smooth. The geostrophic flow would be a little bit stronger if we were able to not smooth the data as much. And shown here is, do we see an R to the minus two-thirds in this delta V over R, R diagram? And yes, we do. And one of the punchlines here is, at least in the Gulf of Mexico, which is a representative of the deep ocean, Richardson's law extends to the sub mesoscale. We've shown other people, shown it definitely, you know, extends, it, it's, it's prevalent in the mesoscale range. Our results showed it's prevalent in the sub mesoscale range. Um, and just mentioned that Akubo's, a lot of this stuff was done in very shallow coastal regimes, including lakes. So it's good to see that this law that people have used for a long time has a fairly long, it, 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 it's a good law over a fairly large range of scales. So one of the things I want to leave you with is that the statistics of the surface velocity field depend on the topography, where you are, it depends on the feature sampled, and it depends on the winds. 